At that time, Jesus was casting out a devil in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. A number of years ago, I happened to be driving while well, I was traveling one time, and all of a sudden I got a phone call, a number I didn't recognize, but I happened to answer it, and um, on the other end was a man who wanted to talk to me. It became apparent as we talked that, that he was a trad Catholic and, um, and that he was in need of some serious uh, counseling and, and help of things that he didn't know. I didn't know him at all. Somehow he had gotten my number and had heard a recommendation that he could talk to me. And so I did talk to him, and uh, it became apparent that just how much of a difficult situation he was in. He had, and admitted to, committing some pretty serious and heinous crimes, and was soon going to be going to prison because of these things. He had been caught and was going to trial and was going to be convicted of them. And his concern was not only what to do and how to, to get out of, uh, to get his, his mind and his soul in a better place, but also how to perhaps be taken care of in the future when he is locked up. I told him, especially having have just met him on the phone, that, well, seeing as things were going to be coming, were going to start proceeding almost immediately, that he should wait till he gets settled in a spot and then call again um, from that institution. And then we can see on what steps need to be done to help him. But I never heard from him, sadly, again. And after a certain amount of time had passed, I, at some point, had made mention of this situation Bishop Dolan, and he asked me if I knew the name of the person, and I told him the person's name, and immediately his demeanor changed, and he said, be careful of that man. He said that he had once been, and very well may still be, possessed by a devil. And then he proceeded to tell me the story of that man. Years ago, he had attended St. Gertrude the Great, and after a little bit of being there, it was clear that the man was troubled, and not just in a normal way, but in sort of a more an extraordinary, way, extraordinary way. And Bishop Dolan, seeing this, was beginning to wonder what to do. The normal counseling didn't seem to be working, and, and there's something more that then just meets the eye of a person with problems there. He was praying, and at a certain point, he happened to find his answer because he had suspected that the man had demonic problems. And with that, providentially, up came from Mexico for a visit Father Siordia. And Father Siordia, who had a long uh, been uh, uh, experience with doing exorcisms in Mexico, was willing, at Bishop Dolan's request, to do the exorcism of this man uh, at St. Gertrude's. And so, Father fasted for a couple of days in preparation, and then the man was called in for it. He knew that it was going to come, and he came to the church, and they performed an exorcism there. Bishop Dolan was, uh, Father Siorio ran the exorcism and was the presider over it, but Bishop Dolan participated in, by sending in the room behind the man and, and praying the prayers along, out of the ritual along with Father Siordia. And then there's a couple of people who were there to help hold him down when necessary. <coughs> and Bishop Dolan said it was uh, quite an interesting experience. He said, because at a certain point in time, the demon that was possessing the man began to very rapidly and in long paragraphs at a time recite the Latin prayers alongside with the priest as he was reading them from the ritual. And then, moreover, at a certain point, 
when Bishop Dolan had made the sign of the cross while standing behind the possessed man, at the sign of the cross being made, the man's head turned around 180 degrees to face directly at Bishop Dolan and snarl at him. With this, this long exorcism being eventually completed, the man, Father Sioria, had concluded that it was not quite satisfactory. Some relief had been gained, but still something was holding on, or the man was holding on to something. And he wanted him to come back for another session. And so they made the recommendation that he come return in a few days' time to give some rest between the ceremony, plus time again to fast in preparation for it. But the man never came back again. And he said, and that was the last that we saw of him. And he looked at me and he said, actually, come to think of it, it took place right in what is now your bedroom before it was set up as a bedroom. So that's where it happened. And he goes, well, good luck sleeping tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Dolan. But it was a sad reality. The man never returned to have his second exorcism. And then nobody had heard from him for years until he contacted me. And then after I had talked to him on the phone and given him means to which we proceeded forward, we never heard from him again. The state of his grave sins, his imprisonment, and ultimately, the despair caused by it all made him not seek the help that could have been his. And so, as today's Gospel says, sadly, the last state of him was clearly going to be worse than the first. Today, we see our Lord casting out devils, in, casting out devils from a man who is dumb. The Jews accuse him of using the power of the devil in order to cast out the devil. Our Lord points out that ridiculousness of them. He says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. But then our Lord warns that the devils be cast out, but they never give up. And that it is that they prepare themselves to return. And return again with a vengeance. To return again with more for us than before. Because having been cast away, having ultimately failed at the long goal of gaining our souls for eternity, they're not going to come back with the same force, but rather with more. And so Christ gives us that analogy of the house being swept out and then the demons returning with seven of his friends and being more entrenched than he had been before. Why did Lent give us this gospel now? Well, it is in direct connection as to with what Lent is meant to be. It is also in connection with the liturgy in terms of the long, the, the extended liturgy outside of simply the Mass. You see, today is the day in which the questioning of catechumens happened in the early church. We know that Holy Saturday, the Vigil of, of, of Easter, is the traditional day of baptisms for converts in the church. It would always been from the very beginning. Well, nowadays, we, with much shorter forms of those liturgies, we do all of the ceremonies on the same day. But in the early church, when the liturgy was, uh, those, those ceremonies like baptism, the liturgical function and prayers to be connected with them were longer, they would do the preparatory parts in advance. And today would be that day in which all the catechumens were brought together and they were asked questions and they were asked about their faith and they were asked in, or to reject Satan and all of his works and all of his pomps and to reject their former 
religions and to turn and that the certain prayers of exorcism were offered over them in that preparatory rite. We still have that core aspect to baptism. It is that first part in which the priest is wearing the purple stole before he switches over to the white. And it is that still contains exorcism. And it still contains those responses and those answers to those prayers. To those, to those, uh, those questions, that is. And so, connected to today is this point where catechumens deliberately give up the things that are harmful to their souls to embrace the true faith. Moreover, we see it connected into that spirit of Lent because it is for us that during this time we are more mindful of our own mortality. We are more mindful of our own sinfulness and our imperfections. We are mindful of the fact that in reality each and every single one of us has made those same promises before our baptisms. Now, most of us had sponsors do it for us because we may have been babes. But nonetheless, we as adults now continue on in embracing those same answers. Do you reject the devil? I do renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? I do renounce them. And do you renounce all of his pomps? I do renounce them. <clears throat> so we reflect on this reality that while we renounce them with our words and in our minds and hopefully in our hearts, at times through our frailty, we forget to renounce them in our actions and we sin. And so we're conscious of it. We are more geared towards making good confessions. It is now the church recommends that everybody make a good confession during this holy season. And that we turn again away from our sins and back to the renewal of our promises. In addition to that, Lent is that season in which we find also the means in which we fortify ourselves against those temptations and we grow stronger in the face of them. In order to be able to be successful in fighting temptation, we have to know where it comes from. The three sources of temptation are ourselves, the world, and the devil. It is easy for us to know the weaknesses of ourselves if we reflect. And it is also easy for us to see how just the world can tempt. But because we do not see demons around us, it is easy for us to forget that that spiritual battle is actually waged for our souls. But we are not to forget it because it is from the devil in which temptation comes when we least expect it is in those times when we are of our guard down and he tries to trip us up. And so we work to overcome and to grow and to be strengthened. How? It is by the very means which Lent gives us. It is by fasting, prayer, and almsgiving. Fasting especially is powerful in combating temptation, especially when coupled with prayerfulness. Our Lord remarks about this in Mark's, St. Mark's Gospel, where he points out that a certain demon is too strong to be just told to go away, but he can only be removed by prayer and fasting. And then in regards to our own preservation, St. Basil speaks of this when he remarks that the fast is weapon of protection against the demons. And so Lent is meant for us to really make grounds in ensuring that our souls remain swept out and clean. We sweep it away by a good confession, but we are not meant to be fearful of that coming back of seven demons. It is only meant as a warning so that we may, may remain resolute 
to know that temptation will come again. Oftentimes we think that we have confessed something multiple times and then therefore, why is it that I keep having the same temptations and the same inclinations towards sin? Well, of course you do. That is what you are inclined to and that is what has been found to be successful before. And so you have not won the battle against that vice by having it no longer tempt you. You win by being successful repeatedly in the face of those temptations. And so they come to you in one way to trip you up, but in another as an opportunity for virtue and for serious growth. But by our confessions, we have to do more than simply clear out our house. It is, as we talked about at the beginning, that we need to have the, uh, we need to have ourselves prepared at all times. And so it comes from those other two essential parts of our good confession, that of a resolution, making this resolution to be firm. I'm resolving again now, I'm not going to sin. And then to make amendment of life, in which I'm trying to apply that resolution to my life. And if we want to find successful amendment, we have to find it in change of application. What do we do differently? How do we approach it to be more successful? What do we find ourselves sacrificing, which may be things that hold us back? These are our means to success, coupled with the reminder of what we have promised so long before in our baptism, and united with the efforts that we make in this season of penance. That is why Lent, is so beneficial to our souls, if done right. That is why this scripture comes now, in the midst of Lent, when your sacrifices are the hardest to persevere in, when your struggles against weakness of our flesh seems to be the hardest, when we are far away from the beginning and yet seemingly so distant away from the end that it is easy to falter in our resolutions of sacrifice and prayer. Reaffirm that in yourself now. If you have staggered, make a new amends to end Lent well. There is still much good that can be done in the time that remains, and still much growth for our souls to ensure that it always is slept, swept clean and made to be a worthy dwelling place for our Lord. May God bless you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.